Pontifical Academy for Life has created controversy again, recently releasing a book that questioned the church's teaching on artificial contraception. What exactly is going on at the Pontifical Academy for Life? We're going to talk about that today on Crisis Point. Hello, I'm Eric Sammons, your host and editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Before we get started, just encourage people to like this video, also subscribe to our channel, and let other people know about it. Also, you can follow us on social media at Crisis Mag. Okay, we have a great guest today. She's returning, Janet Smith. She is retired as the, from the Father McGivney Chair of Ethics, Chair of Life Ethics at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit, Michigan. She's the author of Humana Vitae, A Generation Later, and A Right to Privacy. Her volume entitled Self-Gift contains her previously published essays on Humana Vitae and the Thought of John Paul II. More than 2 million copies of her talk, Contraception, Why Not?, has been distributed. Professor Smith served three terms as the consultant of the, to the Pontifical Council on the Family. Welcome to the program, Janet. It's good to be here, Eric. Yes, and I remember I first heard of you back in the 90s, the Contraception Why Not talk, of course. I was actually converting to Catholicism. Contraception mm -hmm. was a big one because it made no sense as a, as a Protestant not to use it. But then your talk was helped me realize, that, okay, this is actually a good thing that the Catholic Church does by by uh, by opposing it. But now, unfortunately, we're going to talk about some confusion when it comes to that. So before we get started really talking about this book that came out, let's go take a step back. What exactly is the origin of the Pontifical Academy for Life? Like, why was it set up and when was it set up? Uh, well, what do you think? I'm an extra lucky. I did take a little time to review these things this morning. Um, I believe it was set up in what, 1974? It was right? 94, 94, 94 by, um, that's right, by Lejeune um, from uh, France, who was the doctor that uh, discovered the source of Down syndrome and was uh, just a beautiful man, probably saintly from what people say, and um, very much defended the right to life of uh, Down syndrome babies and, and all babies. And so the whole academy was set up in order to uh, defend life. Uh, and there were some real it, and people were appointed for life and really beautiful people who uh, accepted the church's teaching. And it's, you know, it's not just the church's teaching, it's natural law on um, the value of, of human life. Uh, and then in 1917, um, Fran Pope Francis uh, basically fired everybody. I don't, know, uh, I don't know what you say, removed everybody from the, that was on the list of those in the academy and put a lot of new people on redefined the mission. And instead of being an academy that basically defended the church's teaching in the light of modern assaults on the truth about human life and sexuality, um, put a wide, a people of widely diverse views on it in order to um, encourage dialogue and discussion uh, about these issues, which seems now to be uh, being employed in order to actually uh, question and even overturn uh, the, the church's teaching on life issues. So it's the history is a very sad one, I would say. Yeah, so it was founded uh, in 94, Pope John Paul II. But what is the status of, okay, so you were on the uh, consultant on the Pontifical Council on the Family. This is the Pontifical Academy for Life. A lot of these different groups are associated with the Vatican. There's a lot of confusion among Catholics as to kind of what their purpose is and where do they stand? Like, are they part of the magisterium? Are they, are they the Pope's mouthpiece? Like when you say like a Pontifical Academy for Life, what would you say is like it's, it's, uh, it's place in the church as far as like the magisterium or the Vatican and things like that? Yeah, it, it, we'd say it's a consultative uh, group, one that's meant to advise the Holy Father that, um, when a new issue comes up, but something's been challenged, that you put all these experts to work who are able to examine the new challenge and, you know, provide the formulations that people will understand that suit the modern world, that will um, be a, res a response faithful to the uh, magisterium uh, with, for an issue. So that, that's, it, it, has no, um, it has no magisterial authority. In no way does it teach for the church. Uh, but people will get confused by that. They are confused. They think if something comes out by the Pontifical Academy, um, it's some 517-page volume, however many it is, um, that this, in fact, speaks for the church. Uh, 
you know, it, it, and there's some <laughs> some way in which it does, and not in an authoritative way, but evidently, you know, the Holy they say the Holy Father uh, approved of the volume. You wonder if he possibly read all of it, uh, but surely he knew uh, the the main conclusions that were being advanced uh, by the document. And so those who are inclined to challenge the church teaching on any of these issues now have a powerful weapon. Uh, even if it has no magisterial authority, they're going to point to, well, this is where the church is moving. And, you know, who are you uh, to be a retrograde and not realize this, this legitimate development of church teaching? Right. So while we can say very definitively that something that comes out of the Pontifical Academy for Life is not an infallible teaching, it's not a, even a magisterial teaching, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not dangerous and doesn't cause a lot of confusion and problems. And I think that's exactly what we're talking about here. So the volume we're talking about, it's called Theological Ethics for, of Life, Scripture, Tradition, Practical Challenges. And so, as you said, it's over 500 pages. I think it was published in Italian, correct? Or was it multiple? Some of the essays are in English, but yeah. almost all of it is in Italian. Okay. Okay. And so, basically, what what is this volume? Like, what, what was it written by one person? Was it what, what, what exactly is this volume? Well, it, it's a compilation of um, contributions to a conference that was held uh, last year, I think November in 2021. Uh, and... Uh, it's, they were provided, the attendees were provided, I don't even know if there was a physical meeting, but um, the participants were uh, provided with what's called a basic text, uh, which was really a, a fairly radical uh, challenge uh, to magisterial teaching on life issues. And then they were asked uh, to respond. Uh, almost all of the responses are favorable uh, to that basic text. There's a few voices that are, are um, challenged the new reading, but it's almost altogether uh, a challenging of, of church teaching. They don't say they don't say they are challenging it. Of course, they are bringing it up to date uh, to the modern world. They're offering a, a new paradigm. And what is um, particularly sad, I think, is that um, many members of the commission say they didn't even know uh, that this conference was happening or this publication was going to put forward. So. It's in no way a representative of the views of uh, all the members uh, of the commission. One doesn't expect ever to get a, a consensus on something like that, but to include more um, voices that would not uh, accept what the document is saying is, I think, is very important. And you know, it was just a heavy-handed uh, effort to uh, shut out voices that might object to the, the, the principles articulated in the document. Yeah, it sounds like how they run a sentence these days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you basically invite the people you we know. We all agree because we all agree. Right, exactly. Right. That's right. Because I think there's there's over 100 members of this Pontifical Academy uh, on some level. And there's lay people, uh, clerics, uh, researchers, all this stuff. And so basically just because this document, this, vol this huge volume was released, it doesn't mean all the people who are members of Pontifical Academy for Life are actually supported this. And it sounds like it was like it was uh, prepared ahead of time to be something that would go in one direction. Now, the question is, is the whole volume uh, yeah. talking about the teaching on artificial contraception or is it more just is it have more generic uh, talking about morality and, and the morality of acts and things like that? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, it, it, the two documents it, it most frequently references are Humanae Vitae, which is, of course, on contraception, and Donum Vitae, which is on artificial means of reproduction. Uh, but my reading of the document is that um, it, it, it's, a, it's a bizarre uh, document in many ways. It claims to accept the teachings of those documents, all right? It accepts the teachings of them. But really what it does is it advances a, a new understanding, new understanding of conscience um, that calls into question all moral teaching, not just those two. Those two are obviously ones that they most want to overturn. Um, but honestly, their understanding of conscience would basically totally uh, gut um, the church's teaching on morality. And it does kind of make you wonder why it saying that is, is like, why would you bring up the contraception issue now when the fact of the matter is, is that most 
people who claim to be Catholic, who say they're Catholic already just use artificial contraception. Uh, and the, and the, but there are natural means in which a couple could delay uh, conception, moral means and things like that. So it's like the fact that they bring this up when there's really been no push within the church one way or the other about it makes you think that this is just a, a, a way to enter into uh, a discussion to undermine other moral teachings of the church. Does that seem to, to be a, a well, I'm, I'm okay. at? they didn't include homosexuality, but let's, let's put it this way that um, these are the teachings that most people reject. Um, and if, if uh, I think they think they can sell the church better to people if they say, Oh no, 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 no. Well, yes. Contraception is not good, but, but you can use it. All right. Um, that don't invite it's the church is right about their teaching, but if your conscience tells you it's permissible to do this, then go ahead and do it. And of course, I'd say the same thing about homosexual relations. So I think that they're they're just going to the neurologic points. I mean, it is true that, that most Catholics dissent from these things and uh, seem perfectly um, comfortable uh, acting against the church's teaching on these matters. Um, but I think it's if once you once you say, okay, it's church doesn't really, you know, you can do what you want on these things. Um, it makes, they think it makes Catholicism much more palatable uh, to many people. And they might stop the bleed of people leaving the church. Uh, they might make the church more attractive uh, to people. Yeah. So you wrote an article for crisis uh, earlier this week, I think it was, we published it and it's great. And I, I'll link to it in the show notes so people can read it. But what is the core problem with their argumentation here, because you you mentioned it's not that they're even saying they reject humana, vi, humana vitae. It's something a little, I would honestly argue it's a little, something a little more diabolical, but mm -hmm. it's something a little bit different than just simply saying, oh yeah, humana vitae was wrong. What exactly is their argument and what's wrong with how they go well, about it? And, and they know this. I mean, they, they are um, advancing a radical understanding change of conscience. Um, in, in Vatican II and Gaudium et Spes, it said that the conscience is the the um, the, the the place where uh, we hear the voice of God within, and we recognize that there's a law that we need to um, obey that we did not invent. We, uh, that God has has provided laws that we must uh, obey, and of course these aren't they may be burdensome because we have a sinful nature. But at the same time, they are fulfilling of human nature and they're truly liberating, not um, confining because they liberate us from our sinful tendencies and um, direct us towards what is best for us. Whereas um, this group uh, thinks of conscience really as um, not something that God, in the interior voice of God within, it's, it's a repository of my own values. I've made choices in my life and those choices have committed me to certain values. So over the course of my life, I have committed myself to certain values um, in the way that I behave. And that now should be and must be my moral guide, not anything external, not the church's teaching, not even the natural law, all right? It's, it must be the values that I've chosen. And there's, it, it doesn't use the word authenticity so far as I'm concerned, but it, it, it has a bit of that sense of some of the modern understanding of authenticity. I need to be true to myself and my own values. And even though you could say, and it does say that say contraception is, and it doesn't use these words, which is interesting. It doesn't talk about the difference between objective values or objective culpability and subjective culpability, all right? Which the church has always made, that contraception is always wrong. And the church does say that if your conscience tells you that you must contracept, well then you should contracept, but you have still done wrong. All right. And you're, you have badly formed your conscience and it, it could you could be culpable for that. It depends on what your education opportunities, et cetera, of concern. But you you definitely have done something wrong if you've chosen to contracept, even if you're subjectively not culpable. Let's say you're a 14 year old girl and your your parents and your guidance counselor and even your pastor tells you you should use contraception. Right? And you turn to the right authorities in your life to understand what you should do. And they, they tell you there's really nothing wrong with fornicating either that you're love, young and in love and you need to explore your sexuality, blah, blah, blah. 
that kid is hardly culpable subjectively for what they've done. But what they've done is wrong, both the fornication, obviously, and the the contraception. Um, What this document would say, I mean, I don't know how you can talk about a 14 year old uh, having a repository of values, but let's take now the 24 year old. Um, who thinks it's perfectly all right to have sex outside of marriage and perfectly all right uh, to contracept. And you say, they don't even say that you've done something objectively wrong. They say that you, your action, if you are acting in accord with your own values, that you have done, that is the right moral choice for you to make. All right. They, they judge the moral action, not in a kind of division of subjectivity and objectivity, but the, the whole action in their mind is a good action because you acted in accord with your own values. And we need to accompany people on this. Now, it says very little so far. I haven't read the whole 500 and some pages, just some key portions. But um, And there may be elsewhere it makes these distinctions. But in the portions I've read where they should be making these distinctions, they're not making them. Um, it, it's, um, it doesn't say that even though the church is right on this, that we need to lead people, even those we need to accompany them on their journey, as it says other more recent documents, or, or at least articles have said, we need to accompany people. You think, well, at least we could accompany them towards the truth. It, it's, not, it's not even talking that way, um, so far as I can tell. But the church would say, uh, yes, you have to follow your conscience, but of course your conscience isn't what I think is right or wrong. My conscience always asks not, what do I think is right? My conscience asks, what does God hold as right or wrong? And if I'm asking any other question than that, and then once I ask the right question, what does God think I should do? Where do I go to find that out? All right. I look at, if I'm a Catholic, I certainly look at church documents. And I I ask that question, um, what does the church teach? Because the church teaches for God. And if the church teaches that contraception is wrong, it doesn't matter that I think it's okay. All right. Now, if I'm a Catholic, there's no way I can sit and say, well, I think it's okay. You've got to say, no, I'm in, I'm in conflict. I'm in trouble conflict. There's something, some part of my being that thinks it's okay, but I'm committed to the Catholic faith. And I know that the church teaches for God. So why would I follow my own views, which aren't God's views, they're my views, instead of following the church? They don't present any of that in this document. Yeah, it seems, it, but I also, first of all, I, this sounds like the exact same argumentation used in the Morris Letizia, that there's this idea of just that you can determine, I mean, frankly, you can determine truth. And there's, there's no discussion of the effect of sin in this whole process of of what was it they, the phrase they use like getting your own values or whatever like that like there's there's sin involved in that so like for example the 24 year old who's been sleeping around for the past couple years their sin is going to impact his view of what is sinful right. <laughs> because he's going to want to justify himself he's going to want to say that yes it's okay to do this and he's going to and so there, I don't see, I didn't see it in Morris Leticia. I, I, it doesn't seem to be in here either. Isn't there something to be said for the fact that conscience is obviously impacted by original sin, impacted by our own personal sins, right? Oh, yes. And uh, you're exactly right. And that most people, I, mean, I have nieces and nephews, you know, read, some of them went to Catholic schools, etc. And they, they still think, you know, they, they're formed more by the culture than they were by their education at home or their education at school. Um, and they think there's absolutely nothing wrong with cohabitation. And they think that it's irresponsible not to live together before marriage. And since you're fornicating and you're, they wouldn't, don't even know what that word means, I'm sure. But since you're having sex outside of marriage, which they think is a responsible thing to do, they think it's also responsible to contracept because you're not married yet, you're not committed, and it's not the right time to have a child. So that's their formation. All right. So if when they're thinking about should I uh, uh, have sex outside of marriage and should I use contraception, they're just looking at the culture and their their and their peers and um, uh, unfortunately some of the adults uh, in their life as well. They may even go to mass on Sunday, but they don't hear it uh, from the pulpit. All right, and they've been led to believe that as long as they're acting in accord with their their highest values. Um, and they, they don't, these terms don't even make anything to them. They're just doing what they think is sensible. Um, 
and they really haven't examined their va- their values. I mean, when I, I challenge some of them on, well, what do you really think marriage is, and what do you really think uh, God's plan for sexuality is, you get this blank stare. Like, what what are you talking about? God's plan for sexuality. Um, I'm trying to be a good person. I I found this person. I love this person. I I think I want to marry this person. It makes perfect sense for us to live together. As you said, there's so much sin involved in all of that. Um, Not knowing that both our our appetites and our intellects have fallen um, because of original sin. And we're very easily confused by our culture. If you take an honest step back and, you know, strip away cultural influence. It's not that hard to see that these things are, are immoral. It's not that hard. Um, but we are so steeped in our culture that it is hard for young people because they don't even know how to ask the question. It seems like this is a different way of uh, attacking what the church has always believed and always taught in the sense that in previous generations, you just simply denied the doctrine. So the Arians just denied the doctrine that that Jesus is the eternal son of God and is also divine. Uh, Martin Luther would just deny the doctrine uh, of uh, of the papacy, for example, something like that. But in this case, what they're they're actually doing is they're making it sound like when you read them that they're supporting Humana Vitae, they're supporting the teaching of the church. I'm going to read this. If anybody follows this, can follow this, they get like a, a prize or something. But this is actually from the document I'm quoting from. It says, Therefore, as happens with these methods, methods, which already make use of specific techniques and scientific knowledge, there are situations in which two spouses who have decided or will decide to welcome children can make a wise discernment in the concrete case, which, without contradicting their openness to life, at that moment does not foresee it. It goes on. There's another sentence I want to read, too, but just that alone, it's the typical, okay, yes, they're, they're, they're the concrete case is different than this ideal that, that it seems oh, yeah. like they always want to make the, the moral teaching church an ideal, but the concrete is completely separate from that it seems. Yeah. It's interesting that they don't use the word ideal because you're exactly right. That's the way they treat it. But again, that, that, that position was refuted again in the seventies and the eighties, that this was some sort of ideal that we, uh, we held out there, you know, like, <laughs> and unfortunately people, sometimes some cultures, maybe the Italian culture, you know, treats fidelity and marriage as an ideal. And yeah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, it's better to be faithful to your wife, but you know, I have a mistress and everybody else does, so what's the big deal? Um, you know, I, I'm committed to that, but I'm just a, a, a flawed human being. And so it's, it's almost like, you know, you want your kids to keep their room nice and neat and everything. And if they make their bed, you're happy. You know, they've at least made one move towards it. You say, well, I'd like everything cleaned up, but at least you made your bed or you picked up your clothes off the floor. That, that's, a, that's a good step. But um, so that's how they treat morality, as though it's, yes, this is a good thing. But we, and then you hear these words in our culture all the time and in our church, you have to meet people where they're at and people are doing the best that they can. And so we have to approve what they're doing because we have to meet them where they're at and they're doing the best that they can, as opposed to saying maybe where you're at is a really bad place to be. And it, um and your best is not very good when you get right down to it. And we need to really challenge you. I mean, t- take something like homosexuality. It's, it's amazing um, it, that when you find a person who has homosexual tendencies who is ready to really ask the question whether these, is a good, it's a, these are good actions and this is a good choice of a way to use their sexuality, they will start using words like, it's degrading, all right? And it's, um, I'm, an, I'm ashamed that I've made these choices. When you get down to the deepest part of their being, they start, and, and that's where you have to, I mean, you don't come right out and say that when you're having a conversation. You ask people, are you happy? What are you looking for in life? What kind of relationships do you want to have? I kind of like to ask people, what do you think your grandmother would think of this? And why do you think? she would disapprove of what you're doing. And then when they start going in that direction, because they know their grandmother loves them. And so um, we don't have, we're going to lose out that on that argument before long, because the grandmothers have gone the way of the rest of the culture. But for a long time, that was a very good uh, approach to people was to say, um, 
what did you, what would, we, are you, would you like your grandmother to know what you're doing? And they go, oh, why not? Is she wrong? Mm. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. It's interesting they are, because it move them to where they they need to be. Right. It's interesting because back when I was in college and I was still Protestant, I knew a Catholic who uh, lived a lifestyle that was not in keeping with Catholic teaching. We we'll just put it that way. You know, he partied, he did all the things that college kids sometimes do. And then he'd go to mass. This is when I was thinking about becoming Catholic, though. But he would go to mass on Sundays, but he would not receive communion. And I, you know, I had my friend, Catholic friend, asking, like, "Why don't you receive communion?" He's like, "Well." I can't receive communion based, you know, I, I, considering the stuff I did yesterday. And I, I remember thinking as a Protestant, there's actually something beautiful about that in that this guy at least recognized that he's not living up to what he's supposed to be doing. And in that there is a, a place for evangelization, a place. And so he didn't receive communion. Whereas this ideology that we're seeing with from Pontifical Academy for Life, from Amoris Laetitia, stuff like that, is kind of saying, well, to saying that guy, nah, just go ahead and receive communion because you know your values or whatever have made it okay for you to do You're this. Doing the best you can, right? Yeah, and and that just seems, yeah. And so the the next in this document, this volume also says, the wise choice will be realized by appropriately evaluating all possible techniques with reference to their specific situation and obviously excluding abortifacient ones. First, I want to say I read that to my wife, and she said, there's nothing obvious anymore coming from you people. <laughs> yeah. like, that's a good point. It's yeah. true. But, but if it's obviously excluding abortifacient ones, what they're also saying is it's not excluding contraceptive, strictly contraceptive techniques. But again, it talks about this idea of reference to the, their specific situation, as if there are situations in which the ideal or, or whatever, or the, the teaching of church doesn't apply. But doesn't this get into the, the a problem that I, I remember talking about um, on a previous podcast about Morsi Leticia is this idea of the difference between the positive and the negative moral laws, yeah. that there are laws, moral laws, uh, that, that you can break in specific situations. And I, actually the, the, the uh, article by Mueller, I think it was, who made the example of you're driving along the road and you swerve, you, you, you swerve maybe into another lane, which is against the law and it, against morality really to do something like that, except you find out there's a, there's a car coming at you. So you're doing it to protect life. So it's okay yeah. to do what you just did that, but they're using that kind of logic. So can you explain the kind of difference between positive moral law and negative moral law and why the, the logic they're using here does not apply to contraception? Yeah, well, certainly the positive moral law, it, it, it directs you to what you should do, but it has to be very particular when it says, I must be generous, right? Well, what's generous for a poor person, what's generous for a, a wealthy person are very, very different. Um, and so that you can't, you know, it, it's a bit amorphous, uh, a positive law, you know, drive it safely. Well, for most time, it's, it's you know, uh, observe the speeding limit. But if you're getting someone to the hospital that is going to die if you don't get there at a certain time, safely is the best you can do, um, going as fast as you can <laughs> to get them to, to the hospital. And you, know, you haven't broken any laws. You are, I mean, you've broken human law, but not any divine law to protect human life. Is, and so speeding at this point is the thing I can do that's most protective of, of human life. Obviously, without it trying, in, without unduly endangering uh, other cars on the road. A negative precept is one you should never do. It's sort of like, um, you know, don't touch electric fences, all right? You will die. Don't jump off of 10-story buildings, all right? Um, and, and you say, that because you will die. Uh, and you say that so there are certain rule, rules, laws, natural laws, um, you know, fit laws of physics that if you break, um, the, the results are disastrous. Well, so, you know, laws like don't commit adultery means never, never have sex with anyone other than your spouse. If you're a married person, obviously, and you might say, don't be unfaithful to your wife or always be faithful to your wife. That's a positive rule. But does it mean you can never bring flowers to your secretary, let's say on her birthday? Um, probably not. That's probably a nice thing to do. But if you're bringing her flowers a couple of days a week um, because you like her smile and you like to make her happy, well, now you're moving towards adultery, honestly. 
but you can't make a law that says don't ever give flowers to your secretary. <laughs> you have instead the law don't commit adultery. So the church has the law. Again, it's a natural law. It's not a, a man-made law that sexu- that um, again, never violate God's plan for sexuality. That's when, and that contraception does violate God's plan for sexuality. Therefore don't contracept. And it's interesting, as you said, that they say, except for the abortifacient ones. Well, there aren't very many that aren't abortifacient. You're basically talking the, the male and female condom, um, almost everything else. Uh, maybe if you call withdrawal a contraceptive act, that's not an abortifacient, but it's immoral. It's, it is contraceptive and also non-unitive. So it, it's interesting that they have that little disclaimer, but they don't sort of have an asterisk that says, this means just about everything. <laughs> And, um, and and you're so it's it, they're they're very narrowly circumscribing it and acting as a you say as though it were a positive law rather than a, a positive precept as opposed to a negative uh, precept. And what's what's interesting in all of this is you know you it, way back in you know the late 1950s, early 1960s when there was the, the challenges to the church's teaching on on contraception. Those who were trying to push contraception always talked about women in third world countries who had, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 children and, and couldn't feed them. And it was just horrible. And she needed to have some recourse to contraception. They don't even say anything like that anymore because obviously almost everybody's contracepting and they're, they don't have too many children. Um, it's not that they can't, they've only, they may be most likely limiting themselves to two. And so you're saying that you can't, bring out that heartbreaking scenario. Uh, and, it, it, and the fact is, you know, women in third world countries basically have no problem using natural family planning. Uh, they understand that very, very well and incorporate it into their lifestyle fairly easily. We don't in the modern world because we think that sex is for recreation. Um, we think that there's nothing else to hold a relationship together except sex. Uh, and so if you're not having as much sex as you can, which people aren't, but that's what they think is their goal. Um, they couldn't possibly use natural family planning. Many studies show that people using natural family planning have sex even more often, uh, in spite of the um, requirement for abstinence for a certain period of time, than those who are contracepting, because contracepting kind of takes the fun out of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> One of the huge fun items out of um, having sex, which is the possibility of a baby with this person. And when you when you have your act open to that possibility, you are saying something with your body to that person, which is just extraordinary, which is, I'm willing to have a baby with you, which means I'm willing to have a lifetime relationship with you. That's exciting. That's fun. A momentary act of sexual intercourse is physically exhilarating, but it doesn't have a human element, um, the human element of a commitment uh, to someone you love. Right. Now, I think most people who are watching this, listening to this, understand that the church is teaching on against contraception. But I would like you to explain, though, why it is that artificial contraception does violate God's plan for human sexuality and why it is always wrong. Like basically lay out just I know you gave a whole talk on this, so I encourage people to listen to that. But just lay out briefly the exactly why it is that it is always wrong and there can't be exceptions like they're trying to carve for them. Yeah, I would like to remove the word artificial from artificial contraception. All contraception is artificial, but that's not why it's wrong. Um, It's wrong because it is um, violating God's purpose for sexuality. Um, Both purposes. The purposes are uh, to procreate and to uh, form a unitive bond, a powerful unitive bond with the individual with whom you're having sex, who should be your spouse. So God told us from the start, uh, it's, it's interesting, the first commandment is good and how good that man should be alone. And he didn't make him a buddy, all right? He made him a female who was to be his wife, right? And they're meant to leave their parents and uh, form a union, right? For the rest of their lives, uh, two shall become one. That's really pretty much the first commandment. Um, two shall become one. And why? Uh, to be f- fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. I mean, God, and this was all given before the fall. God is a lover and God overflows with love and he wants human beings to love and he wants us to make acts of complete self-giving to other people, um, particularly to your spouse. And the way you make a complete 
gift of yourself is to allow this fertility that is a part of the, the sexual act to, to, to actually to reverence it um, and to say that this, this is an incredible thing that I might become a parent with another person and that I'm willing to engage in this with you means I'm making a lifetime commitment to you. That's the bonding. The bonding isn't the pleasure. The bonding is the lifetime commitment that you make to the other person in this act. So as long as you do not negate uh, the, the procreative meaning of the act, you are bonding in a, a lifetime way because you're saying, I am willing to be a parent with you, which is, <laughs> that's, the most, that's the most profound, deeply profound commitment you can make to anyone. Uh, as anyone knows, once you're a parent, you are a parent for the rest of your life with that other person of this child. And um, so that's the church's teaching, that, this, that sexuality is a great gift from God. He does want us to experience great pleasure. He does want us to have a powerful attraction, physical attraction, emotional attraction, psychological attraction, even philosophical attraction um, to, this, to this other person. Um, because it a lot, it 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 um, it's a push on our back uh, to to get into this relationship um, and bring forth ch children, and it is hard, as you say, in a fallen world. Uh, we're fallen people, and it's it, it, parenthood is incredibly demanding from day one and even before day one, and the amount of accommodations that people have to make uh, to each other and to this child. <laughs> with a friend now whose daughter just had a baby and we just keep kidding how the baby is now the boss of the household. <laughs> the baby dictates everything. When we go to bed, when we sleep, when we eat, everything. Um, with no idea that the baby is a boss. The baby doesn't know it's a boss, but the baby is the boss. And so we've got a new boss in our household. Um, our will is not the will that prevails um, in this household. And so the, the, the father and the mother have to relate in a whole new way. Uh, because of this child and for the rest of their life. And so God made all of this a way of populating heaven. That's what he wants. He wants souls for heaven, but also for the sanctification uh, of the spouses. The generosity that is necessary to be even a mediocre parent is tremendous. Um, and so th that's the purpose of sexuality. I would say babies, bonding, sanctification. Yeah. And I, I would just say that on that last point, that as a, a parent, I have seven kids and, mm. and I've uh, been a parent for over 25 years now that I, I, I have a long ways to go in sanctification, but I have a lot further way to go if I didn't have kids. I mean, they mm -hmm. just really do help you. I mean, just like you said about like you, you, you have to put them before your, your own needs. And it's like, it's funny when we had our first kids, so this is like 25 years ago, just the, the simple of like, you can't just run out the two of you somewhere and gets, you know, like, oh, that's just run out. No, you can't do that because now you have a kid. And and like at first there is this resistance. You're like, you, you know, you don't like that because you like doing whatever you want to do. But then over time, of course, that gets moved and, 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 you know, kind of you realize, OK, there's far more important things because all of a sudden this baby is like the most important thing to you. And it, it, so it doesn't you know, you're like, I, I can I can like give up not going getting whatever I want every second for this person. And that's what I think is most frustrating about. The, the attempt to demean the teaching of the church on this is that it, it, it assumes what the world says about these rules, that they're just things to keep us from having fun. They're just things to keep us from being happy. And yet, as you explained very well, following teaching is what's going to make you the most happy, the mo not necessarily every moment, but it's going to make you the most fulfilled, the most joyful, the most happy, and obviously eternally happy. And that's what they seem to just, act like that's not even true that following these things are just a big burden for people and so that's why we have to soften it so we, we're lifting burdens from people's shoulders and it's not really a burden ultimately because asking anybody who has kids yeah. it's not a burden to have i mean i have seven kids that's not a burden it, 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 it's it's a joy so, yeah so anyway i just, it, it frustrates me when i when i when I, the, the mentality they have. Yeah, people, I mean, one time I was at a talk and there, there was the, the, all the tables and chairs needed to be put aside, put away. And there was this group of young people that just seemed to have so much fun doing it. And um, afterwards they came in and stood around me. And, and I had said in my talk something about, you know, having a lot of kids. I mean, it, 
can be a great burden in certain respects. I mean, carrying in all those gallons of milk all the time and um, picking up all the shoes and again, lecturing one more teenager about whatever. Um, God bless you, one more teenager about whatever. And uh, this woman in front of me who turned out to be the mother of all these kids who had done all this cleaning up just said, I never found it a, to be a burden. Now I, I knew she was lying, okay, because <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, what she meant to say is what you're saying is that in in the reward is so great, it erases the burden. All right. It, I mean, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. And and but then I see these teenagers and I say, oh, my goodness, what you've done, what you have done is raise these beautiful kids who just have a good time uh, cleaning up after a big event rather than resisting it. All right. And so. It, that's the sanctification and that's what we think we've lost something when we've really gained something of immeasurable uh value immeasurable value and one more question about this just the morality of of contraception and whatnot is is natural family planning uh in i've seen among there is a certain segment of catholics who believe that natural family planning itself is also immoral and on the other extreme i have seen Sometimes that some people in the church present natural family planning almost the same as you would you would sell uh, artificial contraception, for example. So why is natural family planning not immoral? But what are some of the maybe potential dangers of it? Well, again, natural family planning that the, it requires several things that are extremely beneficial to a relationship. One is an honest discussion about why you're limiting your family size. Um, you need to talk about that. Why? Because people don't like to abstain. And so, um, rightly so. And so they say, why are we abstaining? And you, when you have to express your reasons that are coming out, that you, it becomes clear whether they're selfish or unselfish, right? And you have to kind of figure out where you are. So it, it helps people be very intentional about their sexuality and what are their priorities. Um, you know, we don't want any more children because uh, I don't want to buy a van. Whatever. And that, it turns out sometimes that is the reason. And you, you sort of put that out there and you say, well, really, can I put that before God as a legitimate reason for not wanting um, more children? So it requires a lot of communication and does require um, self-control, which always benefits any one of us when there's any one of our appetites that we um, have to learn to control. And the, the sexual appetite with, in, the, in a bed with your beloved spouse is one of the hardest ones though people of course abstain for all sorts of reasons because they want to watch a sporting event on tv for instance um is a, a regular reason for not having sex this evening uh or, tomorrow night honey uh you know somebody's on the the, the tv that might, might, might not happen often but people do that or the walls are thin or you're visiting people etc cetera, etc cetera. you have don't have sex for all sorts of reasons and not having sex because it's not a good idea to have a baby um, is one of the better reasons. So um, that people can use it selfishly. Um, people can, can get, they can gain such self-control that it's just not that hard. And they've decided they don't want um, to be generous about having children. They've had their four, maybe four is enough. Um, and, you know, we, we're, we've got enough money now to join the country club or to go on these expensive vacations and a baby would just make that all difficult. Well, that's selfish. But usually, usually and if using NFP chips away at those reasons. Again, I said you have to say it out loud, and it sounds pretty shallow. And then, secondly, you do have to. There's going to come a time where you really want to have sex, <laughs> and it's the fertile time, and you really have to say, "Are we going to go ahead or not?" And so, it kind of helps you overcome your selfishness. Um, it can be used for selfish reasons, but if someone said to me, how do you overcome that? I said, well, just keep using NFP. Mm -hmm. Keep talking about why you're using it and keep being conscious about when it would be really nice to have sex and it's fertile. And do we really want to say no to ourselves? Yeah, I think in practice, it's very difficult to use NFP long term in a, in a, yeah. in a marriage in a selfish way. Yes, potentially at one month or something like that, you could potentially... You know, but over the course of a, of a long marriage, I I it, I don't see how really. It can oh, sure. well, there are, I agree with you. I think people who are selfish will eventually get a vasectomy or tubal ligation because they've had they're done. Um, right. and and that that phrase to say we're done is is very defiant. Um, 
you know, there may be times when you, in fact, you should be done. They use, use an NFP, but so many people I know have had a late in life baby. Um, and it was not, you know, the first thought of it is, oh no, diapers all over again and all this. And the baby comes and oh my gosh, yeah. the whole household changes that the kids you already have are delirious um, that there's a baby in the household and, and you discover all over again baby love which is just so powerful yeah let me tell you from experience it's much harder to get middle of night and change a diaper at 46 and it is at 26 <laughs> but it's still worth it i mean that's the thing is i mean you still have this beautiful kid and and, and it's very and much how do the older ones respond yeah right. yeah that's right so um one last question is do you think that this document that the uh pontifical academy for life released do you think it is going to potentially lead to francis writing an encyclical like he did amoris Laetitia, that will undercut the church's teaching on contraception i don't know uh possibly uh again i think just like amoris Laetitia, um it's ambiguous enough that you can um say that it hasn't really changed the church's teaching it's just opened a door for those who uh, I mean, I think that's what it was intended to do, but I think the Holy Spirit is <laughs> still in charge, always will be in charge, uh, and will never let the Holy Father um, teach in a magisterial way uh, something that is opposed to um, infallible, constant, uh, infallible and authoritative constant church teaching. It's, uh, I don't believe it's going to happen, um, though there there might be all sorts of documents that suggest that it has happened. Um, I, I can foresee that for sure. Right, right. Okay, well, let's pray and that they don't even open the door for people to interpret it in that they, way. They've Go done on. that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so is there, how can people find out about the stuff that you're involved in and things that you're doing right now? Well, I'm retired now, you know. Um, but I have a yeah, but you're still active. <laughs> yeah, I just say read, read Crisis Magazine if you want, want to know what I'm doing now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, don't you have a website? What'd you say? Don't you have a website? I do. It's it's uh, not as um, comprehensive as it should be. And one of these days, I'll maybe I, I've tried many times over my life to get something up and going, but it just sort of sputters. Uh, it's JanetSmith.org. Uh, my my talk contraception why not is there for a free download, and I really wish people would promote that because I recently gave a talk to maybe fifty very good Catholic. Folk, kids from Focus, and I think two of them I've ever listened to my tape. Not that they were pro contraception, but they hadn't listened to my talk. I guess I should call it now. It's an MP3, maybe MP4, MP5 download. What's what are yeah, we? I don't even now? know. I still MP3. call them tapes. I talk about like Scott Hunt's conversion yeah. tape. I mean, because yeah, so know. anyway, I I, th I still think it's 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 very valuable for people yes. uh, to listen to it. I mean, the, the studies to some extent are out, out of date, but you can take two seconds to Google the, the right words and you'll find the latest studies, which honestly completely confirm the older studies. Uh, it's not as if things have, have changed. Uh, they've only gotten worse, not better, except uh, there's fewer abortions, we think, maybe not, uh, but there's fewer surgical abortions than there used to be. There may be more abortions because of the abortion pill, uh, et cetera. Okay. Well, I'll link to your site and I'll link also to where they can download the um, contraception. Why not? So, cause I do, I do encourage and, and recommend anybody to listen to it. Uh, it really does uh, present the arguments very well. So, okay, well, great. Thank you very much. Jan. I appreciate you uh, being on the program. It's good to be here. Eric. I love what you're doing. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Everybody until next time. God love you. Mm -hmm.